ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about this. Uh, just so you guys know, uh, this is the Battle of Issus. It is one of the battles uh, that uh, Alexander the Great is going to be involved in, in his conquest, basically, of the known world. It occurred in 333 B.C. on November 5th. And what's going to happen is the battle is going to pit anywhere from 100,000 to, depending on who you're talking to, 600,000 uh, Persians or uh, people, members of the Achaemenid uh, dynasty or empire versus Alexander the Great, and he had somewhere around 40,000 men, right, total. Uh, the reality is it's probably closer to about 100,000 uh, Persians, uh, just so you know, because having anything much larger would have been unwieldy, very difficult to accomplish back then. But still, you're talking large, large, large numbers of people. Well, here's the deal. The background to this battle is that Alexander the Great, in his moves into the Persian Empire, had troubles with supplies. He did not have a substantial navy. He didn't have a navy. And so the Persians controlled the water. So he couldn't effectively get supplies from the ocean. In order to make it difficult for the Persians to use the navy against him, what he decided to do was Alexander went from port city to port city, and he would lay siege to those cities and then take them over so that the, the Persians could not use that port. But every time he did this, he would have to leave some of his men behind, making his army progressively smaller and smaller. This is a real issue because he's always going to be up against a larger enemy. Well, as he is traveling through uh, the Persian Empire, uh, he uh, makes a stop through places like Egypt and randomly becomes a pharaoh. Uh, he also uh, shows up a place called Gordium. And it's at Gordium that he comes across this amazingly intricate knot made of, uh, basically made of rope. And the idea is anybody that can untangle this Rubik's Cube of a knot is going to one day control Asia. So he purposely shows up at Gordium. And here's Alexander the Great looking at this knot going, there's no way I can, I can undo this knot. And according to legend, everyone's like looking going, oh, this isn't, this doesn't bode well. And so there are two possible outcomes. The one that I prefer is that Alexander got so angry that he took out his sword and he just cut it. <laughs> Ta-da! That's one possibility. That's the one that I believe probably happened. There was another one where he looked at where it was attached to a cart and there was a simple little pulley and he's like, and it fell down, and he's like, that, that's not Alexander-esque. I like the hacky hacky thing. So here's the deal. As he's traveling through the Persian Empire, he's constantly dogged by or followed by the Persian Navy. And so what he ends up doing, he's like, I've got to, I've got to eliminate the possibility of the Persian Navy and the, and the Persian Army ever linking up. He hears that Darius III is massing a huge army in Babylon. A huge army. And so Alexander decides, I'm going to take some of the last of the southern cities, one in particular called Issus, I'm going to take that city, and then I'm going to move down south because I anticipate that uh, Darius is going to attack me from the south. So he takes the city of Issus, and then he travels with most of his army this way. He drops off Parmenian with a few of his, particularly cavalry units, here to guard his back. And then he travels down here thinking that's where Darius is going to show up. Well, just so you know, Darius does not show up there. Darius was no dummy. He brings a very large army. And instead of attacking in the south where it was anticipated he was going to do, he attacked from the north catching Alexander by surprise. And so all of a sudden, Darius is in Issus. Now, the problem with this is that Alexander had left Issus in the hands of just a few of his men, 
plus basically he had set up a field hospital there. So any of his injured soldiers were there. And when they were overrun by the Persians, Darius took all of these wounded soldiers, took them out of their bed, chopped their hands off, and then stuck their stumps into burning pitch, like boiling tar. All right? That cauterizes it. And then he said, go find Alexander. Tell him what I did. Hmm. So all these guys head in this direction. They meet with Parmenia. And they try to get his attention for a long time, and Parmenian doesn't notice. Why? Because they were waving, and they didn't have hands. Oh, that's horrible. I'm sorry. But here's the deal. Yeah, oh, whoops. It's early. But here's what happens. They get here. Parmenian sends word to Alexander, who's down here. Alexander's like, you've got to be kidding me. He's behind us. That's threatening our supply lines. This is going to ruin everything. So Alexander turns around and forces his troops to march northward. Well, what happens here is uh, Darius, with his 100,000 men, set themselves up here at the Pinarus River. Now, they have less than two miles across here, right? It's basically a beach, and then there are mountains here. So what happens is this. Darius sets his troops up here. His wing is heavily covered by his cavalry. These are guys on horses. He has his immortals set out right in front. He has Greek mercenaries, Greeks, that he has paid in phalanxes right here. And he has his regular infantry here. He has his own personal mounted bodyguard of the cavalry here. He is personally sitting in a golden chariot directing the battle from kind of the back. But he's still directing the battle. All right? They're going to outnumber Alexander's Macedonians two to one, easily, at least. Alexander arrives, and he looks across the battlefield, and he's like, wow, there's a lot of enemy there. He sets some of his cavalry over here under Parmenian. Parmenian is one of his most trusted generals. They're over here. He's in charge of his own companions right here. His Macedonian phalanxes with the 16 to 18 foot long sarissas are right here, all right, facing this river. And then he has two relatively weaker groups of people known as peltasts. <coughs> a peltast is a person who has either a sling, sometimes a bow and arrow, sometimes a pointed stick. They're really not well armored, but they're fast. For foot soldiers, they're really quick, and so you use them as skirmishers. They can rush out, attack the enemy, and outrun anybody who's wearing armor. So that's what you can use them for. So he has them on his uh, right flank. Here's the deal. Darius knows that the battle is going to be here. It's going to be here. Because this is an area that's easiest to cross, this river. It's easy to cross. And this is the smartest place. because. Here's where his cavalry is. Here's where Alexander's cavalry is. This is where the battle is going to commence. This is where the battle is going to be won. However, Darius sneaks a group of infantry over here in the mountains just to mess with Alexander. Alexander is forced to respond with some of his peltasts. All right? Heavy infantry, peltasts. That, that's not something that Alexander wants to, to do, but he has to. The battle commences. And what happens is this. Darius sends his cavalry sweeping across the river into Parmenian. Now, Parmenian's cavalry soldiers are very good. However, they're outnumbered two to one. Alexander very specifically said to Parmenian, you must hold. The battle hinges on you holding as long as you can. So here's what happens. When they sweep in and they cut across, <coughs> what's going to happen is this cavalry group is going to be pushed back. We'll just make this into one big group. It's much larger. They are engaged. All right? Just so you know, Parmenian's men are having a hard time. They're fighting, they're maintaining, but it's difficult. At that point, 
Alexander says to his peltasts, these guys, he said, advance, I will lead you. So here's the king of Macedonia with his weakest troops saying, I'll lead you into battle. So he swings over here, follows them across the river, and they strangely attack, attack rather, the left flank of the Persians. Right? That's just a weird move. It's something that Darius did not expect to happen. Strangely enough, they're not defeated immediately. They're kind of throwing off these Greek mercenaries. The Greek mercenaries are kind of waiting to get word. They're like, what are we supposed to do? We're being attacked over here, but it's really, it shouldn't be a threat. Alexander then shifts his attention back to his companions. And then what he does is he says to his infantry, advance. And he advances them in an interesting echelon manner. I'll explain. These guys stayed put. These guys started marching. These guys went first. So what you had was this group engaging first, then this group, and then this group. And what happens is these infantry people are attacked first. These guys are not yet attacked, so they're standing there waiting to be attacked. And these guys over here are looking over here at this attack. Now here's the deal. The Macedonians are outnumbered, woefully outnumbered. But remember, they have the really long sarissas. So their job is to try to break up the immortals. Their job is to break up the Greek mercenary phalanxes. That's what they're trying to do. And so this is all engaged. <coughs> Parmenian is losing. He's slowly falling back. At this point, Alexander should not be able to win this battle. He is losing. Darius III knows that he's losing. He's like, this is awesome. I'm going to beat Alexander. Alexander then chooses this moment to attack. And what he does is this. He sweeps in and crushes right through this group of Greek mercenaries. Now, they are infantry. He's on horses. He slices right through them, right through them. But he doesn't stop. And he goes into these guys. This is regular infantry also. He and his companions slice through them. Right? They're going through infantry. They're not trying to kill them all. They're going through them. The companions with Alexander are now here. What does he do? Please. Does he hook back around and try and attack Darius? Why would he not hook back around and attack the enemy from the rear? Yes. And doubly important, Darius. And that's exactly what he does. Instead of attacking these guys and hitting them piecemeal, he doesn't have that time. These guys are struggling. These guys are struggling. He's going for checkmate. He heads directly towards Darius III. Darius notices this because Alexander is extremely noticeable on the battlefield. He wore special armor. And you, you got to think about it. Darius is like, I'm winning the battle, I'm winning the battle, and oh, I'm going to die. Because that's Alexander looking right at me. And so Darius thinks, okay, well, I'm just going to mosey away from the battlefield. So he actually turns his golden chariot around. The problem is, it's a golden chariot. It's made of gold. And it's slow. And so he slowly starts his retreat. And he's heading this way. Alexander could conceivably continue the battle if he wants to. And now he has an advantage. But these guys are struggling. These guys are struggling. He doesn't do that. He follows Darius. He chases him down. Now here's the deal. These guys back here see Darius leaving. They see him leaving the battlefield. They see him being chased by Alexander the Great himself. These guys can't see that. All right? They don't know what their leader is doing. They've lost their leader, but the, their leader told them to fight, so they're going to continue to fight, and they're well-trained. 
<coughs> Alexander could have continued to chase Darius. It was getting late, just so you know, toward evening. But he recognized the struggle that these guys were having. And so instead of doing that, he swept back in here. While that's occurring, these guys run. They're like, our leader left. We're out of here. These guys say, our leader left. We're out of here. Everyone is trying to follow Darius so that they can survive. They're worried, obviously. And Alexander then starts cutting these people to pieces. <coughs> these guys then receive, well, they're given an order to retreat, even though they're winning, and they retreat. Now, Alexander follows Darius as far as he can, killing hundreds and hundreds of them. Alexander wins this battle just because he could read the battlefield, and he personally led his men to victory. He, he, he made these guys fight like they'd never fought before. He trained these guys to fight against unbelievable odds, and Parmenia was able to fight, and he should not have been able to win. He, he didn't have to win. All he had to do was not lose. The end of the battle, Alexander comes back, and they were able to capture uh, Darius's plunder, all of his uh, camp, including a gigantic golden uh, uh, bath that uh, Alexander was able to, to climb into, which I think is very funny, uh, and also Darius's mom, wife, and two daughters. Right? <laughs> Darius apparently left them behind. <laughs> How'd that happen? All right, yeah. Wait, they stole his bathtub? Yeah. <laughs> and his mom. And his, well, yeah. <laughs> Bath or mom? All right, <laughs> so what's interesting about it is, however, that Me. Alexander now has these incredible prisoners, hostages. He treats them exceptionally well. Exceptionally well. According to, uh, according to legend, uh, he kept them for a year. All right? One of them... The daughter, he ended up marrying. So he kept her forever. Uh, the uh, <laughs> Darius's wife <coughs> apparently returned to Darius after a year, and then a little while later had Darius's son after a month or two. Oh. Mm. <laughs> hmm, maybe you treated them nicely. All right, so what happens because of this battle? Some of you are slowly getting that. Well done. Uh, this is going to pave the way for Alexander to take the entire Persian Empire all the way to India. Also, he's never going to have to worry about Persian naval support again. The Persian god king, Darius III, was defeated. This is the first time Darius on the battlefield was defeated. He'd lost to Alexander before, but never when he was personally in charge. This is going to take away his credibility as a godlike ruler. Eventually, his own men are going to kill him and present him to Alexander, very dead. They present him to Alexander and say, please, Alexander, stop killing us. We have a present. All right. And what's going to then happen is after the Battle of Issus, Alexander is actually going to have people call him king. I want to be called king. I want to be called king of Asia. Uh, just so you know, He's going to be the king of Macedonia from 336 until uh, 323, that's B.C. Uh, it, the king of Egypt, the king of Persia, and then he'll declare himself the king of Asia. All right, yeah? When you're talking B.C., does it go down? Yeah, it's, go yep, okay. yep. All right, so, unfortunately, unfortunately for Alexander, he is going to be able to, to control an unbelievable land area but he's also going to find it very difficult to figure out how to permanently control it. He's going to die at a very young age. He's actually going to die in 323. Now, he died either because of a fever, some people think he was poisoned, but on his deathbed, when his generals, all of his trusted generals, said, Alexander, who is your empire going to go to? He said, let my empire go to the strongest. <laughs> And you know all the generals are sitting there going, yeah, to the strongest. Uh, guys, I'll be back in a few moments. 
And they all went back to their own armies, and then they started fighting each other. And this is going to cause a huge problem. So Alexander's empire is not going to survive his death. Right? But absolutely fascinating. Alexander the Great is by far one of the greatest military commanders of all time. All right? Any questions? Yes, um, Starman. Was Bucephalus at the Battle of Issus? You know what? Bucephalus was at most of his battles. This was an early one, and I believe Bucephalus actually was at that battle. Others. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Oh, yay! When did Bucephalus die? I cannot remember the exact year. I should have made it up so I sounded intelligent, but I'll have to look it up. All right. Cool. Thanks, friends. Awesome. Talk amongst yourselves.